The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Hello and welcome to another live edition of What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Thomas Nagley, and with me tonight is, of course, Father William Jenkins. He is a traditional Catholic priest, a member of the Society of St. Pius V. And he's also the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church right here in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. How are you? Very fine, John. Thank you. How are you doing? Great, Father. Great to be here. It's good to see you. Father, I think uh, we have a very entertaining program tonight. We have some wonderful questions on the docket. Uh, just to give a sampling here, we have uh, questions concerning the three days of darkness and the purple scapular, uh, questions about UFOs, the Catholic perspective we should have on that. Uh, we have a few <clears throat> questions concerning scrupulosity and other uh, errors of the conscience and how to remedy those. Uh, also a question about Arianism <clears throat> and the lessons we can learn from that in, in today's, uh, today's crisis in the church. So we'll see if we can get to all of these, Father, but uh, I guess first we have a few uh, few announcements, a few items that we wanted to get through, and uh, I guess the first one would be the upcoming retreats that we are going to have uh, very soon. So could you speak a few words on the upcoming retreats with the oh, men's sure. and women's retreats? At St. Thomas Aquinas Summer Camp, Summer Camp and Retreat Center, we have a uh, ladies' retreat starting in mid-June. I think it's the 17th of June, is that right? Sounds right. <laughs> and uh, then a week later, in the 20th, Third, we have um, actually maybe the ladies' retreat starts on the 16th of June, but the uh, 23rd the men's retreat begins, and um, so we encourage people to make those retreats. Right. Yeah, absolutely. All they have to do is uh, contact Immaculate Conception Church office, and they can uh, sign up. Mm -hmm. They generally start on the Wednesday of the week, Wednesday evening with Mass, and then go till noon on the following Saturday. Right. So uh, just uh, just shy of uh, three full days. So, but we cover a lot of ground in those days, and so I think I know they'd be well, uh, well worth the time and effort. A great opportunity. We've had retreatants come from Washington State and California and. Florida, and uh, so I think we've had retreating from out of the country uh, a couple of times too. So um, come one, come all. As you know, if you uh, want to hear the Catholic faith and and learn to love our Lord better, then by all means, uh, come and join us. Uh, we also have the children's camp coming up, right? And uh, mid July, boys' camp starts, and then girls' camp toward the end of July. So. I encourage people to uh, come and help. The best way they can help is have their children come to the camp. Get a lot of benefit out of that. But uh, we also have an open house for the Academy coming up on May 20th, the evening of May 20th. And uh, we're getting prepared for that. It should be a very good, very interesting, very not only enlightening, but inspiring evening that is being prepared. So I certainly encourage uh, all those in the Cincinnati area uh, to come and take part in the Academy Open House on May, May 20th. Uh, doors open at 5.30 and the little program begins at 6, 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. So uh, I encourage all to come. And uh, whether you have children in the school or don't have children in the school but might or don't have children to place at all. It's still uh, part of Catholic education and uh, everyone, every one of us has an interest in that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Father, we also have the public rosary coming up this Sunday, I believe. We do, yes. We've had a series of public rosaries actually we gather at the steps of the courthouse, the Hamilton County Courthouse, and we, uh, we assemble there basically um, begging God to have mercy on our country. Right, as a public witness of our faith, and in recognition of the kingship of Jesus Christ. Uh, this is our prayer. We pray 
uh, to our Lord for the um, restoration of all things in Christ, right? And um, so I encourage everyone to come and take part. That's at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. This coming Sunday, which is, what, May 16th? I believe so, yes. Am I right about that? Yes. And uh, that'll be at the Cincinnati um, address of the Hamilton County Courthouse. Correct. Yep. Okay. Uh, do you know the order, address at, offhand? No, off the top of my head, I believe it's on uh, Main Street. I don't have a vacation. It's yet. easy. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Yeah. It's easy to find, though. Yes. No doubt about yes. it. Yeah. It's uh, yeah. Hamilton County Courthouse, 2 p.m. And uh, Father Greenwald will actually be leading that rosary. Um, I'll be traveling for the Holy Day, the Feast of the Ascension, and uh, gone for a few days. But Father Greenwald will be leading the rosary on the Sunday, May 16th. Great. So everyone should come and take part in that, begging God to have mercy on our country and establish his kingship over our land and its people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <coughs> All right, well, Father, let's get into some emails then, if you're up for it. Uh, the first one, from a viewer who asked if you could please discuss the three days of darkness and the purple scapular in reference to Marie Julie Jehaney. Well, this question has come up before, and um, as I recall, when it did come up before, I, I pleaded ignorance, and uh, I'm still no expert in the subject, but uh, have... At the instance of our questioners, uh, trying to look into this question a bit, and uh, it, the whole question is related to Anna Maria Taiji, uh, the housewife, uh, mystic, saint, uh, actually died, about, I think it was the year 1837 that she passed away. So she lived half her life in the 18th century and half of her life in the 19th century. And uh, actually, uh, the last time I was in Rome with our students, we had the benefit of visiting um, her, her relics. Uh, the uh, custodian, was the janitor there, was actually locking up the church, and we intercepted him just at that moment. And... Um, he graciously agreed to let us come in, and uh, I appreciated that very much. I think she moved him to open the door for us, and we all went and spent uh, about 10 minutes there in prayer at uh, her incorrupt remains, and um, we're very grateful to that for that. Um, she's in the Trastevere region of, uh, of Rome, and... Um, it was she who spoke about these three days of darkness as part of the great chastisement. And uh, then uh, the uh, mystic stigmatist uh, Marie Julie, well, I think in English we say Jahini, uh, Jahini, uh, who actually lived from 1850 to 1941, so a long life, I mean, 91 years of life, and living uh, basically through the First World War and even in the beginning of the, of the Second World War, and basically also uh, living, um, you know, a uh, hundred years or so after Anna Maria Taigi. And uh, some say Taigi, but it would be spelled in such a way that it would pronounce T-A-I-G-I, Taigi. Uh, and uh, Marie Julie Jahani added to the a certain precisions to the three days of darkness. Um, now, there are those who claim that because Marie Julie Jehenny's um, stigmata and um, uh, revelations that came to her were approved by the local bishop, that they are perfectly authoritative for Catholics. Um, that is not that is not true. The universal authority of the church's magisterium has to pronounce that such private revelations are credible, worthy of belief, uh, that they do not conflict in any way with the church's teaching. Uh, that they, uh, you know, we have every reason to believe that they are from heaven. They do not form a body of, of public revelation, of course. That ended with the death of John, St. John the Apostle. But uh, nonetheless, um, God has sent, as he had in the Old Testament, prophets. So God also sends his saints to us. Uh, sometimes our Blessed Lady, sometimes our Lord himself appears. 
Um, Sometimes he sends uh, St. Michael the Archangel or other angels to come. So there are heavenly messengers who come to us. And um, in this case, uh, Marie Julie Jaheni, uh, Jaheni um, claimed to, that she received visions of our Blessed Lady and messages from our Blessed Mother. Is it possible? Yes, of course. Um, her local ordinary believed that it was correct and true. As they say, I don't know of any... Uh, recognition or any official recognition by the magisterial authority of the, of the Roman Catholic Church as such uh, to endorse these visions but uh, from what I've seen I, I do believe that they're authentic I believe that she was truly a mystic and I would say that there is good evidence to believe that she had the stigmata of our Lord uh, when she speaks of the three days of darkness, uh, in concert with uh, Blessed Anna Maria Taigi, or Taigi before her, I do think there's something to this. Um, there are discrepancies. For example, Anna, uh, Blessed Anna Maria Taigi speaks of three days and three nights. Whereas uh, Marie Julie Jahani speaks of uh, three days and two nights, minus one night, and she mentions Thursday, Friday, and Saturday of a week, early in the year, early, early in a year, like uh, the early months of the year, at a time when the days are growing a bit longer, okay, so that would indicate perhaps after the solstice, you know, um, that the three days of darkness would hit. Um, there are uh, provisions for a terrible uh, calamity striking the entire world, a darkness so, so deep uh, that one can see little during the day, absolutely nothing. It'll be as dark as a coal mine at night, is what I recall reading. And even what one can see, uh, one should not. Uh, instructions not to look out the windows of one's home to see what is happening out there. Um, and because it is so terrible, right? Um, again, you know, one might wonder, well, what does a, plane, a pane of glass or a tube, what would that do? What kind of protection would that afford, right? Uh, if such horrible things are going on outside, you would think that the windows of a home would provide precious little protection but for the fact that God is protecting them, right? So, um, and even the idea, you know, don't look out because of what you see will be so horrible, you know, you'd be affected by it, possibly even killed by the sight. Well, I mean, there are precedents there in the sacred scripture. We know that Lot's wife was told not to look back at the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and she did, and she died, right? Turned into a pillar of salt, right? So the idea of something being so horrible that God's chastisement is so, so dreadful, uh, we are to avert our eyes. I mean, there is a certain precedent there. Even the three days of darkness, there's a certain precedent. The ninth plague uh, with which God struck Egypt is basically, uh, I guess, the premier precedent in sacred scripture for this whole idea of three days of darkness. When Moses was told after the plague of locusts and so on, Moses was told to stretch out his staff and uh, three days of darkness would descend upon Egypt. A darkness so thick it would be palpable. One could sense it, you know. Uh, one could almost feel the darkness smothering, you know. And, uh, and uh, this is what we read in the book of uh, Exodus chapter 10 about these three days of darkness in which uh, everyone was supposed to sequester themselves away, not venture out, not look out. And so, you know, anyone who has a question about that can go to the book of Exodus chapter 10 and, and check that out and see that it is true. Uh, and um, even commentaries talk about how the palpableness of the darkness would be cause of these noxious exhalations in the air. Well, again, this seems to be echoed in the ideas of, the th of three days of darkness as spoken of by Blessed Anna Maria Taiji and uh, 
uh, also, um, you know, uh, Julie Marie Jahani also. Uh, Marie Julie Jahani. So, um, I mean, you know, Tom, one of the reasons why I was very, I balked at the whole idea is because of the seeming contradictions, you know, the idea, well, you know, people who talk about these things, um, um, I, I think kind of embellish them and with some kind of goofy ideas, which sort of takes away from the credibility of them. It doesn't really, it, it, it doesn't necessarily reflect badly on the private revelations so much as it does what people make of them, okay? Because some say that, well, only the, the blessed and 100% beeswax candles will burn and give light, but even they will not burn in the homes of the wicked, uh, which will be plunged in darkness, and that nothing will light except these candles, which give people a rise uh, give rise to the idea, well, you have to have blessed matches to light the blessed candles, and they have to burn blessed oxygen, and, and so on. And, you know, they, they, they drive it to the point where it becomes pretty much absurd. And uh, so, you know, people miss the point and, and don't take it seriously. Even, even with the purple scapular. Um, well, again, there are those who say, well, look, the local bishop approved of it, so it's got to be Catholic. But that's Maybe he approved of it for his diocese or whatever, but that doesn't extend uh, universal approval throughout the entire church for all time. That's not true. And uh, there's no, that I know of, blessing for the purple scapular in the rituale, the Roman rituale. Nothing approved for the whole church. There is a recognized red scapular of the passion of our Lord which seems to be exactly what the purple scapular is supposed to be about. And so why, again, the redundancy, it, it seems peculiar. Uh, if you look in the, in the Roman ritual, the church has, in fact, uh, approved officially the blessing of the red scapular, the passion of our Lord, uh, and, and I, has done so for quite some time now, you know, perhaps for centuries. So, so um it seems to be redundant, but then you see people get stuck to when they're talking about the purple scapular, uh, which they ascribe to, um, you know, uh, Marie Julie Jahani. It's it's very specifically uh, let's say, spelled out by Our Lady about every little detail on it, and it just seems to be um, kind of excessive <clears throat> compared to. Um, again, past private revelations. So, you know, you wonder how much of this is uh, are add-ons by people interpreting this for themselves, and how much of it actually originates with the, a stigmatist herself. You know, you just uh, have to ask yourself. And then there are websites that try to capitalize on this by by going through this, and, and they're offering for sale the 100% beeswax, beeswax candles. And as you're reading along, they're, they're, you know, they're advertising these different candles that will last for so long, um, and uh, advertising the purple scapulars made from just the right wool, from just the right part of the world, and made specific, you know, exactly to Our Lady's specifications, and don't fall for you know, cheap invitations and, and all that stuff. And it, um, I think it, um, well, shall I say, detracts from the seriousness of the issue. If one were to ask me if I believe there three days of darkness would be included in the great chastisement, I'd say, well, it is certainly very possible, and at this point I think it would be um, uh, credible to think that it would be, uh, because of the precedence in sacred scripture and because of the words of Blessed Anna Maria Taigi, Taigi, she is recognized by the Church as a blessed. And uh, other revelations we have, uh, private revelations, seem to correspond to that idea. But again, uh, I would say beware. Beware of in private interpretations of the 
private revelations, <laughs> uh, even if you believe in them. I mean, the idea that if you have a, a purple scapular, it is going to, going to shine like the sun in your home during the, days of, during the three days of darkness and enlighten the entire home. Well, then what do you need the blessed candle for? <laughs> right? Uh, again, there's a contradiction here. Clearly, there's a contradiction in these two things. And um, the idea, also something I find rather, rather offensive, is that uh, if one of your loved ones is caught outside and you know, is begging you to let them in to safety, you must uh, bar the door and not allow them to enter the house to save themselves. You must... You can't even uh, look out to watch them perish in the noxious fumes and all. Um, well, I mean, I, I find that prohibition against an act of charity um, to be, well, actually, rather shocking. Uh, I just can't imagine Our Lady, you know, telling people, whatever you do, if one of your sons or daughters, one of your children shows up at the door begging, uh, for Haven, or your wife, or your, your husband, or your parents, whatever, but don't let him in. <laughs> um, I just find that incredible. You know? well, Father, is there any source that you're aware of that we can go to to see exactly what they did initially say before all of these kind of private Well, if there is some additions? official, reliable uh, rendition of what... The, the alleged seers had to say, uh, you know, concerning the the predictions of Blessed Anna Maria Taiji, there should be. If she's a blessed, there's got to be some kind of authorized edition of her works, I would think. Um, and uh, I would think that there must be some reliable rendering of the words of, uh, uh, you know, Marie Julie Jehenny also. Mm -hmm. And I would say just read what they say and uh, avoid reading too many commentaries of people who are trying to tell you what they really meant or embellish what they say. Um, but until there is an official traditional Catholic commentary on, the, on these revelations, well, we have to take it all with a grain of salt anyway and realize it's not part of divine revelation uh, that one is bound to believe as a Catholic. Um, so what is needed here is prudence, you know, Catholic prudence all the way around. Say, well, you know, these things um, seem to, co the things that s coincide with what we do know as Catholics, uh, we should take seriously. The things that don't, we should hold with a certain reserve. The things that contradict what we do know, we should... Um, have more than reserve. We should be more than skeptical about these things, right? Uh, so, um, but uh, I do find it credible myself that there would be these three days of darkness um, attached to the great chastisement. You know, something else that, that I have a trouble fitting into the whole scheme of things, though, is, well, the way it's presented is these three days of darkness are going to come as a mercy from God basically to slay the enemies of Christ, to slay the enemies of the church, pre predominantly those, and um, to then pave the way for the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And this is before the coming of the Antichrist. As though the time of tranquility and peace, the reign of Mary's Our Lady's Immaculate Heart will follow the three days of darkness because of all the conversions that will result from it. The church will be triumphant once again, and this will happen then before the coming of the Antichrist. So it's a little difficult for me to place all of these things, um, especially the timing of these things, um, considering the situation in the world today. Um, I'm still trying to uh, figure out, uh, well, even in my own mind, how this could progress or proceed, you know. Maybe others have studied this and maybe some have, uh, um, you know, a, a good explanation of how all of this 
would, uh, would progress, and I'd like to hear what they have to say about that. Um, there, there are, uh, you know, the idea of the, the, the signs in the sun and the moon, the, the heavens and so on, uh, well, maybe that's where we're getting the UFOs now. I <laughs> maybe that brings in the UFO situation. Funny you should ask. Yeah, you know, funny thing. <laughs> but, that, but, but anyway, um, you know, Our Lady did say at Fatima in the end, my Immaculate Heart would triumph. I think there are, other, though, there are those who uh, see Our Lady's words forecasting a great chastisement, maybe at the end of the chastisement. She doesn't mention three days of darkness specifically, but that her Immaculate Heart would triumph after that. Uh, she doesn't mention the coming of the Antichrist, and perhaps they're saying that the Antichrist will come after that. I'd like to consult Father Kramer to see uh, what he might uh, speak of in that. I don't know that he even mentions three days of darkness. So. Not sure. Anyway, so um, in any case, our Lord does not spell all this out for it, for us, okay? Uh, he um, just wants us to recognize the significance of what's happening today, right? And what our responsibilities are to him for this day. So he doesn't uh, give us, shall we say, a timeline or a, 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 a roadmap. Uh, even the apostles asked our Lord, when shall these things be? When shall these things come to pass? And our Lord said that the Father has reserved these things to himself. Right? So um, it is not for them to know. And if it wasn't for them to know, well, clearly it's really not for us to know either. But our Lord said uh, that he's revealing these things to us, and he revealed them to them, so that when they came to pass, we would understand. And we would understand one thing in particular, that he is in control. That nothing that happens we're witnessing is an example of our Lord somehow losing control of the situation. Quite the contrary. Whatever we see happen, we know is a fulfillment, indeed, of something that he told us that was going to happen. And rather than shake our faith, it should confirm our faith in him. Absolutely. Well, Father, if you're ready for it, we can get into the question of UFOs. We've had, had, had multiple viewers ask about this. Um, apparently, I, I guess it's been in the news a lot uh, frequently. There was um, apparently in, uh, sometime in June, uh, upcoming this, this upcoming June, there is some memo that is apparently going to be released by the Pentagon where they acknowledge the, quote, reality of UFOs. Mm -hmm. um, so, Father, what, what, is, what is your opinion on UFOs? What should Catholics think about them? Um, any, any comments there? Well, of course there are UFOs. Oh, yeah. Are, of course there are UFOs. I mean, what does UFOs stand for? Unidentified flying object. And there are lots of unidentified flying objects, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I myself was an unidentified flying object once. My transponder on my single-engine land aircraft, my, my transponder failed. And I became an unidentified flying object for a while. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, anybody who's looked up at the sky and seen something he, he, doesn't, he can't identify is looking at an unidentified flying object. Uh, they're talking about an extraterrestrial, yeah. uh, you know, craft visiting from another world, you know, somewhere else in the cosmos. Well, now we're talking about something else, okay? Um, if, if we're saying, uh, we're talking about spaceships from another, another civilization, another world, we're talking about flying saucers and all that other stuff. Uh, we're talking about the, the realm of science fiction. Um, then you got to, we have a problem, okay? <laughs> that we have intelligent life elsewhere in the universe. Uh, f far developed beyond our own um, technology, able to uh, uh, you know cross the light years and uh, the vast distances of space, and all of the challenges, and and come and visit our world. Well, now we have a different question of uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. Visitors from other planets. There's been talk for some time now of transpermia, of the fact that the the idea that life 
uh, came to Earth uh, from another planet and either from, it was blasted from the surface of Mars by a meteor impact or actually deliberately brought by some other uh, intelligent life and, and planted here uh, to see what would grow. You know, There are all kinds of theories about that. And it's all the result of a very fertile imagination. Um, there's, there's an enormous amount of effort made to find other planets, exoplanets, and to speculate about what kind of life could, could grow on those things. But it all depends, that all depends upon the idea of evolution. And the uh, quasi-scientists and pseudo-scientists speculate about these things because they are desperate to find signs of evolution of life. Um, you know, the, the idea of uh, finding some kind of quasi-life form, a proto-life form on Mars, on the Moon, wherever uh, we can look for it, uh, creates headlines, you know, immediately a blast of headlines that, uh, my goodness, you know, the Mars rover found this evidence of life on Mars, you know. And then the, the headlines disappear because it amounts to nothing. It was just sensationalism. But the idea is clear. They want to plant in people's minds that life evolves uh, without any divine intervention, without any divine creativity, without any divine design. You know, it just happens from inorganic matter. Uh, so the evolutionists have a great stake in this thing. And not only evolutionists, but atheists and all those who rely on evolution to somehow justify their, their ideology. They have a great stake in this. Those who want to destroy Christianity. Uh, and just, uh, you know, the, not only the divinity of Christ, but even the idea of divinity, except for man. Um, or whoever, um, shall we say, uh, devised man in their laboratory on planet X, whatever it is, uh, they have a stake in all this. And, of course, Satan has a stake in all this, a very big stake in all this. Um, now, as somebody who's always been interested in astronomy, and um, I grew up, you know, fascinated with dinosaurs and all that, Right, I um, still find it all very fascinating, but I believe that this current almost rage growing into a craze of UFOs and this uh, now the military industrial complex getting involved in this is all part of a scam. I really do believe it. It's all part of a scam. I believe it's uh, all part of the fact that, that we have developed technology to the point where this is all very credible. And uh, not only that, but I believe that they have some tricks up their sleeve and they're going to be unveiling some pretty spiffy technology which is going to convince people, in fact, that uh, there are extraterrestrials, uh, intelligences that are far beyond our own, that somehow uh, we are either created by them or... Um, somehow um, a kind of evolutionary um, brothers and sisters of these things. Um, and they're going to show us how to run the world. I mean, you know, how, we're, how we're going to create a new world and recognize that we are the gods of this world. Uh, a la Gnosticism. Uh, I think this is a, a, a scam and a fraud, and I think it's a diabolical deceit to uh, turn people away from God. Um, make them deny their creator and make them deny that they are created um, by a knowing and, and, and loving infinite God um, and redeemed by our Lord Jesus Christ. I think they're, they're, they're going to pull something. They're going to try to find a way to pull all of this together. And the Antichrist ultimately is going to be the the great uh, messenger who is going to bring this, this somehow all together so it will deceive uh, practically the whole entirety of mankind. Um, 
somehow he's going to have to try to bring, um, you know, the various religions of the world, the various um, uh, the religious sects of the world, like, uh, you know, um, Muslims and Jews and Buddhists and Christians and even would-be Catholics into the fold by weaving a tale that makes each think that he is speaking their language, sort of like a mockery at Pentecost where the apostles were preaching about our Lord and uh, the Father, God the Father, and they were speaking one language, but everybody heard them speak his own language. And somehow like a mockery at Pentecost, the Antichrist is going to be speaking one language as it were one story but everybody's going to read in that story what he believes. Uh, and they're all going to find uh, the common ground. Um, but it will not be faith, it'll be anti-faith. That's what I, I think this is all about, really. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's interesting, by the way, that uh, Alistair Crowley, um, the great Satanist, the wickedest man alive, right? Uh, the man who wrote the Book of the Law uh, against patriarchy, all in favor of a uh, matriarchy. Um, the, the telema, his religion of telema, um, willfulness, you know, do what you will. Uh, this man uh, actually claimed to somehow be in contact with or touted a, um, a spirit which he called Lam, L-A-M. And you look at the drawing of uh, this spirit, Lam. <laughs> I'm telling you, Tom, I, I think we, you might have seen this yourself, and you can back me up on this. This is an extraterrestrial. This is a, a, a drawing of our modern extraterrestrials. And this is not a, the spirit of anything good. This is the spirit of something evil. So I think we're about to be, well, let's say this, I wouldn't be surprised if we are about to be visited by this lum. Mm -hmm. uh, there'll be those who, by the grace of God, will not be deceived. They'll see lum is very lame. <clears throat> but the rest of the world will be taken in by this because, as G.K. Chesterton said, when you stop believing in God, it's not as though you believe in nothing. It's that you can believe in anything. You can be convinced of anything. And I'm afraid that's where the world's going around. Okay. Well, Father, we did have a couple more uh, more serious topics. Well, I think that one's pretty today. serious. Yeah. <laughs> uh, perhaps more, more Catholic <clears throat> topics. I thought this was a great question. That we've but, by the way, Tom, sometimes. if you don't mind, yes. there was actually, I, I think it was a, um, was it a uh, an episode of uh, the Twilight Zone, or maybe it was I don't know one of these strange science fiction series about a man who agreed to undergo operations to make him look like a space alien, some space invader, that he would appear on Earth and he would terrify humanity into unity, that the nations of the world would pull together because they thought they were being invaded by creatures from outer space. And he underwent all these operations to make, make him look like something like a giant crab. And uh, they simulated some landing of the spacecraft and he emerged from the spacecraft and they just shot him. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like this one. And, <laughs> and that was the end of that. And, uh, I, I don't know whether One Step Beyond or one of those old uh, shows that, yeah. you know, featured the bizarre, mm. the paranormal. But this idea, you know, of somehow uniting humanity around a common fear of invasion. Uh, in this case, perhaps uniting humanity about a common hope of invasion. You know, this, is, this has been ripe in the human imagination for some time now. Well, would that it were dispatched of that easily, Father. <laughs> uh, right. right. You said it. That's good. Okay, well, for this one, next question, Father. Uh, this viewer asks if you could speak about the uh, any parallels and relevance of the Arian heresy in the Church's past to today's crisis in the Church. He says, uh, 
any parallels that you could identify may help Catholics trying to be faithful to get inspiration from the faithful of that generation that lived through Arianism? Mm -hmm. Well, Catholics know that when we're talking about Arianism, we're not talking about Arianism like Hitler, Arian, right? Uh, some, might, some of our moderns who don't know the ancient history of um, the priest Arius and his heresy might somehow connect it with Arian, you know, Arianism as Hitler's belief, the Arian race, A-R-Y-A-N, mm -hmm. the ancient race from which the Teutonic peoples had descended were to be the master race and this idea of uh, the Third Reich, the Thousand Year Reich, the reign of this Aryan race. This is absolutely nothing to do with it, okay? Um, but Hitler was an occultist and um, he um, very much had this strange idea which coincided with the idea of theosophists about the ascended masters, right? And even his SS was involved in these occult, occultic ideas and occultic practices. But when we're talking about Arianism, we're, uh, we're talking about as it affects the Catholic faith, um, just after the church had been given its liberty, just after Christianity became legal in the empire, with the victory of Constantine at the Milvian Bridge to the north of Rome, and his triumphal entry into the city, and then Edict of Milan, uh, making legal belief in Christ and worship of um, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, the Blessed Trinity. Uh, very shortly after that, in the same century, uh, there arose a heresy against the divinity of our Lord. And um, when I say very shortly, I, I mean, think of the fact that Constantine's victory uh, over Maxentius took place in the year 311. The Edict of Milan took place in 313. And by the year 325, the Council of Nicaea was meeting to discuss the, the Arian heresy, denying the divinity of Christ. So this happened very rapidly <laughs> and um, in rapid succession. Arius was a priest from Antioch. That should have been a warning because Antioch was a very turbulent crossroads of a city um, and uh, where the various cultures met together. And um, it was in Antioch that St. Peter was bishop for seven years before he had to go to Rome to confront the error of Simon the magician. Um, but, uh, and uh, of course, to become the Bishop of Rome and the Vicar of Christ as Pope. But um, Antioch, you might say, was kind of a, a training, a training ground for St. Peter uh, before he got to the capital of the empire. And, um, but Antioch is a turbulent city, bred some turbulent characters, and the priest Arios was one of them. Arius uh, made his way down to Alexandria, Egypt, where he made quite a splash. Uh, the bishop of Alexandria at that time was named Alexander. And, uh, but Alexander was an, was an elderly man. He wasn't schooled in Greek philosophy. So when the priest Al um, Arius arrived, um, a man from Antioch who was schooled in Greek and Greek culture and Greek philosophy, he was speaking in terms that the bishop, the elderly bishop of Alexandria, really wasn't familiar with. He was a catechetist. He wasn't a, um, a philosopher, Alexander. So there was a young, a young deacon there, a young man who was a deacon named Athanasius. Athanasius was schooled. Uh, you know, Alexandria was basically your university town of the, the era. The great library of Alexandria is a primary uh, product of that learning that seemed to all gravitate to Alexandria. It was in that milieu that Athanasius grew up and was, ex was uh, educated. He was very familiar with what Arius was actually saying, and he knew what he was getting at, and he was denying the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, and Athanasius uh, opposed him. And later on at the Council of Nicaea in 325, it was the deacon Athanasius who was called upon to stand up and explain to the bishops gathered there, 318 of them, what Arius was actually saying with his fancy Greek terminology. 
uh, of the philosophers of ancient Greece. And so he, um, when, the, when the bishops realized what he was getting at, helped by St. Athanasius, uh, they were horrified at the re denial of the divinity of our Lord. Um, now there were bishops who did side with Arius, and they were exiled, the, the Arians, with, with Arius. He, he was exiled at that time as well by the Emperor Constantine. Um, and uh, there were some bishops who stayed behind. One of the most notorious of them was the Bishop of Nicomedia, um, who was actually kind of the court chaplain of, of, uh, of Constantine, and so retained an influence over him. And he was a very intriguing, he was, he was given to intrigue. Um, so as not to be exiled, the semi-Arians, as they were called, uh, resorted to subterfuge by a very subtly altering the creed, the Nicene Creed, um, so that they could sign it in good conscience, but they subtly altered it uh, imperceptibly to others by saying instead that Jesus, the Son of, that Jesus Christ, the Word of God, was similar to the Father, but not of the same substance of the Father. So in other words, he resembled the Father, but was not actually uh, divine. Um, and so uh, they were allowed to stay in place, and they worked <coughs> their dirty work, including Eusebius of Nicomedia. Uh, and he finally influenced Constantine to believe that Arius had been framed, essentially. And Arius was called back from exile, and he returned in triumph to enthrone his heresy. He was actually on his way to the, uh, to the cathedral in Alexandria to demand that, uh, that St. Athanasius, who had become the bishop of Alexandria, give him Holy Communion. A very symbolic gesture, to say the least, because Athanasius was supposed to show that he was in communion with Arius. Um, and Athanasius was waiting for him. He was not going to give him Holy Communion. He was a heretic. He was not going to give him Holy Communion. Arius died on the way, very famously. He never arrived at the cathedral to demand Holy Communion. Um, Athanasius had paid a great price for that because uh, in his struggles against the Arian heretics and his struggles to uphold the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God, uh, Athanasius actually had to spend 17 of his 30 years as Bishop of Alexandria, actually uh, in peril of his life from their, um, just their, their fury, their rage against him. Um, are there any parallels between that day and this? Yes, there are. What would the parallels be? Well, St. Jerome wrote that 80% of the bishops had actually ultimately become Arian heretics. Um, there are some famous names of bishops who did not. The most famous in the East, of course, was St. Athanasius. The most famous in the West was St. Hilary of Poitiers, uh, both of which were mercilessly persecuted by the Arian party. Um, but they, at that time, spoke to the minority. And we have, uh, again, a situation today where these bishops of today, uh, so-called, of, of a new order now, really, uh, for all practical purposes, uh, do not speak of, as Catholics or Christians by any means. Uh, they do not act like Catholic bishops at all, okay? They um, basically... Um, support the enemies of Christ and the enemies of the church. And uh, many of them are uh, openly corrupt, immorally, you know, in their support of immoral behavior. I think uh, just recently even uh, the controversy of whether even to give so-called communion to so-called President uh, Biden, um, you know, there's a controversy. Some some of the Novus Ordo bishops were... Um, 
saying that they should not give communion, uh, the wafer, to Joe Biden. And I think uh, even the head of the Conference of Catholic Bishops here, so-called, in America, came out and said that, you know, we can't weaponize the Eucharist, and so it's not right to withhold the Eucharist. You know, we have the example of St. Athanasius back then, um, who was going to put his life in peril because he re would refuse uh, to give communion to a heretic and uh, thus state that uh, he was in, in communion with heresy. We recently had the example also, by, by the way, of Saint Hermenegild, who, um, the son of the king um, in Spain, who refused to receive communion from a, a heretical bishop. So we, we have the examples of a bishop who refused to give communion to a heretic, the example of a layman who refused to receive communion from a heretic. They would not be in communion with heresy. Um, so we have, we have that. We also have um, the, uh, the treachery of, um, well, in, the, in those days, we had the failure of Laborious. Um, the pope was recognized and still is recognized as a Catholic pope. But he excommunicated St. Athanasius for his steadfast resistance to the Arian heretics. Uh, the Arian heretics trumped up charges against him, and it is believed pressured Laborious into excommunicating Athanasius. Of course, the, ex the excommunication has been recognized by the Catholic Church throughout history as being null and void. You can't excommunicate someone for being Catholic. Uh, you can't excommunicate someone from the Catholic Church for being Catholic. And Athanasius was. And that was a stain always on Laborius' career, such that even years after the years afterward, even to this day, Laborius is not recognized as a saint. The other popes before and after him for quite some time were all recognized as saints of God, but Laborius was not uh, because of what he did in in favoring the Arian heresy, right? <clears throat> and um, so we have today a, a situation which is even more extreme, where we have a series of Novus Ordo pontiffs. Uh, when I say that, I mean pontiffs. They're actually uh, pontiffs of, the, of a new order. Uh, and that new order is not Catholicism, but it is actually anti-Catholicism. Um, they have created a, a religious construct, which is that of modernism, which St. Pius X condemned as the, the worst error the Church has ever faced and the most formidable enemies, the modernists, the Church has ever had to deal with. And it is all um, now institutionalized in the Novus Ordo and Vatican II and everything that came from it, their new Mass and so on. So, yes, there definitely are parallels between that day and this, but I would have to say that uh, uh, St. Pius X was truly prophetic when he said that these are worse enemies than even the Arian heretics. These are worse enemies uh, because they are so cunning, they're so deceptive, they are within the very heart and the, in the very bloodstream of the church itself. And they don't just deny a doctrine, they deny everything. They redefine the very meaning of faith, as St. Pius X said, which is at least the destruction of all true faith and all true religion. He said that modernism was the complexus of all the heresies, like the synthesis of all the heresies rolled into one. And you know what that definition, what that defines, apostasy. That's the very definition of apostasy. So that's what we're looking at here, and I guess it shouldn't surprise us then. And his first encyclical, after he was elected, he was elected Pope St. Pius X, August 4th, 1903. Two months later, October 4th, his first encyclical appeared in which he talked about his election. He said he was terrified to be elected Pope because he feared that the events forecast by St. Paul and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 were happening or near at hand. And there he was talking about the great apostasy and the coming of the Antichrist. Wow. Um, look it up. 
Second Thessalonians chapter 2, St. Paul spells it all out right there. That's what St. Pius X thought was it at hand. So uh, it's not idle, to spe idle speculation to speak of it. St. Pius X in his first encyclical spoke openly of that. Um, so in any case, uh, Tom, there definitely are parallels between that day and this. But I would say that um, this modernism is, is uh, the, the, what should I say, Arianism taken to its, to its full extent and its horrible logical conclusion, uh, apostasy. Wow. Okay. Uh, well, Father, if we could just quickly do uh, this one last topic that we had. I know um, you you could uh, you could write a book on this, and books have been written on this. But if you could just touch on um, this idea of scrupulosity, we had a viewer write in and says he's uh, he's been accused of this before, and and wondering how he goes about uh, remedying this problem. And uh, we had another viewer uh, along the same lines just ask if you could go into a bit of, de a bit of detail about uh, scrupulosity and other errors of the conscience and what are the, the remedies for this and how do we obtain a perfect conscience? Well, uh, <laughs> in 10 words or less. Not to, <laughs> to narrate a book in 10 words or less, that's right. Maybe 20 words. Well, when you say accused, I, I've never heard it put that way that someone is accused of being scrupulous. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, one is accused of a crime, and scrupulosity is certainly not a crime, it's an affliction, right? And uh, it generally, well, these days, I think that they consider it to be falling somewhat under the heading of uh, even uh, from obsessive compulsive disorder, where, uh, I mean, in the, in the psychological field, okay? And there are some similarities, uh, but uh, simply speaking, um, as simply as I can, long before there was such something called OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder, long before that, there was the phenomenon uh, and affliction of uh, scrupulosity of conscience. And when one is scrupulous, one feels guilty all the time, basically. Um, and there's a great perplexity of conscience in knowing whether one is guilty of any sin, um, and knowing whether one is guilty of serious sin or not, and uh, one cannot resolve that doubt, and one cannot escape that anxiety. Um, and scrupulosity can be very targeted. One can be scrupulous about certain sins and not others. For example, one can become very scrupulous about matters of purity, um, uh, to the point of, of basically being uh, tormented by even the, you know, the, the, the most remote brush with anything that would uh, violate purity, and yet, at the same time, be very uncharitable and think nothing of it. So, um, scrupulosity can be, um, as I say, you know, limited to certain areas of the moral life, <clears throat> certain commandments as opposed to others. It's not as though someone is scrupulous about everything all the time. Um, and um, But it, it is certainly an affliction, and it is actually very dangerous, because the devil can use the scrupulosity to drive one to despair. I could think, well, no matter what I do in this particular area of the moral life, I always feel guilty, and no matter what I do, I can't escape that guilt. I could confess this, um, whatever it is, a million times, and be absolved a million times, and still feel guilty with it. Um, and so I give up. I can't escape it. Uh, I'm not even going to try to deal with it. And uh, it's very dangerous from that point of view that the devil can use it and drive it and uh, drive into distraction uh, to the point where he just despairs. Um, so um, uh, it, it is an affliction, uh, but a very dangerous one. Uh, how does one get into that state? Well, 
I tend to think uh, that it, it has to do with um, having a very delicate conscience, being raised in a very uh, moral atmosphere. When I say moral, I don't mean raised by scrupulous people, but just raised so that one is very conscientious about right and wrong. Uh, most people are not badly affected by that at all. Most people are actually benefit greatly from that. But there are some who might be might tend to uh, obsess. There are some people who just tend to obsess, almost like a, a natural inclination that way. Now, one could talk about the temperaments here and say, well, melancholics tend to obsess about things. So maybe melancholics have a greater tendency towards getting scrupulous. And I would send, I would send it's probably correct that those of a melancholic temperament might have more of a tendency to lapse into this pattern of thought, of anxiety, of whether they were, you know, everything was just exactly right in what they did. And they're tormented in thinking that maybe they transgressed in some way or another. Um, for example, uh, a young lady might be wearing a very modest skirt, but she might be scrupling, scrupling, well, I guess you'd say, over whether it was a half an inch too short. And, uh, or whether if a, uh, like a, a, a breeze had blown the skirt, so maybe, you know, too much of her calf was visible at one moment in time, and she's responsible for that. Uh, a, a young man, uh, you know, might be scrupling over um, whether or not he, uh, you know, uh, it could be, could be anything, you know, whether, whether he had a glance, whether he took a glance, a second glance, and then, or even a first glance, and what he thought, and be thinking afterwards, oh, what was going through my mind? You know, did I have lustful thoughts or whatever? And he's tormented. And uh, the, again, a very great danger of that is the devil will play that and say, well, you don't know what your responsibility was. You don't know what you consented to. Go back and look again. Replay that over and over again in your mind until you can figure out what you were thinking at the time. Well, of course, do that and you turn one occasion of sin into a million, and a person keeps trying to revisit, it, revisit the situation, you know. Well, I had this burst of anger, okay? Now, did I, and I had this flash of revenge in my mind, you know, <laughs> just a vision come to my mind of who knows what, you know. Um, and I go away and I think afterwards, was I really thinking in terms of killing that person? Was I really wishing that person mortal harm and danger? Um, and so they replay this in their mind and they, they uh, worry about it. And time comes for communion, to receive Holy Communion at Mass. And they're thinking, well, I am in the state of mortal sin. Well, I don't know. Did I, did I consent to it at all? Well, I don't know if I consented to it at all. But if I did consent to it, I probably gave full consent to it. But I don't know that I even gave any consent to it. And they go round and round and round and round and round. Uh, Mary go round. And it's a torment to them because they don't know uh, where they are. It almost paralyzes them like they're, they, can't, they can't act. We just had the uh, epistle of St. James uh, talking about the law of God is like a mirror in which you can look and see how you stand before God when we examine our consciences and look at the moral law of the commandments, the precepts of the church and the virtues and the vices and all the rest and how they're applied in our daily lives. And, uh, you know, a person with a, a tender but accurate conscience can go down the line and make some fairly accurate appraisals of what he's done and what he's not done, what he consented to and how much he consented to it. Uh, but a person who's scrupulous has this blurred vision and can't really make out anything clearly. And all he's got is vague doubts and fears, and there's no escape. And that's how you know that this is the devil's doing. God doesn't um, make people scrupulous. It's a disorder. Uh, it's an affliction. The devil wants people to be scrupulous, and he's the one who plays the scrupulosity. I mean, 
when, when someone does something wrong and is guilty of sin, um, God's purpose is that that person would, acknowledge, would know it, acknowledge it, repent of it, and be forgiven. That's what our Lord wants. I mean, our Lord died a horrible death for the purpose of <laughs> not only obtaining forgiveness for us, but even giving us the graces necessary to seek forgiveness. And so our Lord loves to forgive. He wants to forgive. Um, he almost begs us to allow us to forgive him by giving us the grace to repent and calls us to him to repent because he wants to forgive. Um, so to say that, that our Lord is tormenting this soul by scrupulosity is absolutely wrong. The devil who does something like that. When God speaks to the soul, he speaks with great clarity. And the soul just knows that this is the truth and is grateful and sees it as a, uh, a, as a statement of God's mercy and love for that soul. God is uh, relieving that soul. He's not, he's not visiting that soul with doubt and vague fears. Satan is the one who afflicts the soul with all these vague doubts and fears because all that the soul has to, left in the end is fear and has no idea what to do about it. There's no escape from it. Um, you know, it's almost as though, you know, when, when someone is in the quicksand, God throws them a very stout rope and practically lassos them to pull them out, you know, whereas Satan throws them basically, uh, you know, a, 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 a strand of spaghetti. <laughs> And, you know, they can't grasp anything. There's nothing they can grasp there to get pulled out. Um, and so there's no escape from the trap of quicksand that Satan has lured them into. They, they're there, they're drowning in it, they can't get out. Because they don't know what's wrong, they can't identify it, they have no idea what the solution is. And no matter what they do, they're still wallowing in their anxieties and fears of guilt. And uh, that is not the way God acts. So when you have someone who clearly is scrupulous uh, and is just kind of, uh, you know, caught in this, in this gossamer web of anxiety and fear of guilt, but they can't even tell you whether they sinned or not in the first place. And they, they just feel terribly guilty all the time. Uh, you have to try to bring them out of that. And you can't um, make it go away any more than they can. Uh, they can't just wish it away. They just default to anxieties like that. And this is their anxiety. It's a moral anxiety. I mentioned like obsessive compulsive disorder, like this, this you know, OCD. Well, there are similarities. In fact, there's a book called Brain Lock, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, some researcher on OCD actually tried to, uh, uh, you know, examine how to help people in that condition. Toward the end of the book, he actually um, makes four, well, more than recommendations. He prescribes these things to his patients who come to him with OCD. He prescribes four things that they have to do. And as soon as I read them for the first time, I thought, well, that's exactly what Catholic priests have been advising their scrupulous people for hundreds of years now. And they're just discovering this now. <laughs> you know? But I thought, well, you know, there, there are parallels between OCD. But in this case, it's not a matter of somebody thinking they left the iron plug in and turned on or left the water in the bathtub running. And he keeps going back and checking it and making sure it's not, that the iron is unplugged, that the water is turned off. And he does it over and over again because even though he's intellectually aware that he checked it already and it was, he still worries about it. He can't shut off. He can shut off the water in the bathtub. He can turn off the iron, but he can't turn off his anxiety in his brain. Uh, some say it's the amygdala in the brain, which is a kind of uh, 
almond-shaped and sized part of the brain that seems to give us warnings when there were, there's danger. That's pretty handy when you're going to cross the street or when you're standing at a railroad tracks and you hear the whistle of the train coming. You know, uh, It's nice to be able to ha have enough anxiety about that to get off the tracks or look both ways before you cross the street. These things save lives. The amygdala is very important to us, especially in a fallen world, which is, well, somewhat hostile to us. But um, when the amygdala gets stuck on and is attached to moral questions in one's life, that can be really a cross, heavy cross to carry, you know. And so the practical directions are very important, as I say, what the priest gives. One of the first things he, the priest um, tells people who are scrupulous is you have to realize that this is your scrupulosity speaking here. This is your scrupulous brain, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, plaguing you, tormenting you with these fears, these vague fears. It, it really isn't so much your conscience as it is something in your brain giving you this sensation of anxiety, and it is affecting your conscience. <clears throat> but conscience is um, basically the judgment of the practical reason with regard to the rightness or wrongness of something to be done here and now. Uh, it's a judgment of practical reason, and what you're doing here is not an exercise in reason, because you know reasonably you're not guilty, but you just feel guilty. And there's something happening in your brain that is inducing that feeling of anxiety in you. So you have to make that distinction. The first rule, I think, that the, the author of Brain Lock said is, when you, when you start feeling this way and get worried about this, tell, tell yourself, it's not me, it's my OCD. <laughs> Basically, we're talking about something very similar there. Um, you have to make that distinction. It's not me. It's my OCD. Like, you distance yourself from it. You know? um, but you also have to tell people, look, uh, you know, you have to realize this is an affliction, and you, you do have to, in a sense, distance yourself from that scrupulosity. And you have to try to listen to your intelligence now. And uh, when it comes time to communion, for, to whether or not to go to communion, uh, the church deals with these things and has for a long, long time, people's anxieties. And, uh, for example, the church has a principle that if one has a, a, a good conscience and generally does not give in to certain sins of anger and hatred or lust and whatever, that if there's a doubt about whether one did give full consent to what would ordinarily be a mortal sin, if there is a genuine doubt, then one can give himself the, of the benefit of the doubt. If he's in the practice of not giving into that sin, and it's rare that he would, then where there is a doubt, he can presume that he didn't in that case. And he can do that with peace of conscience because if he knew for a fact that he was guilty and he was in the state of mortal sin, he wouldn't go to receive. And so he has a, a, an actual determination that he would not commit a sacrilege under any circumstances, knowingly, willingly, absolutely. Uh, so that even if he decides later he made a mistake, it was an honest mistake, and he didn't commit a sacrilege because he had every intention not to do so. But if someone is in the habit of committing these sins and falling into these sins as often as not giving in to, let's say, a sin of lust or, you know, looking at purely at things or people or whatever, if he does have a weakness in that regard, in a particular case, he might have a doubt about whether or not he consented. And in that case, he wouldn't give himself the benefit of a doubt just because of his track record. He would not give himself the benefit of doubt. He finds that, yes, he is prone to consent to those things. And he does spend time of his life in the state of mortal sin, and he knows that because of these sins. Uh, no, when there is a, a, a doubt, he would, uh, the doubt would not be decided in his favor. He should not receive communion until he goes to, to confession and receives absolution and repents of it. Um, but what I tell a scrupulous person is when, you, <laughs> when it comes time for Holy Communion, you ask yourself, do I know for a fact that I'm not in a state of mortal sin? Now, you might actually say, yes, I, I know for a fact I'm not in a state of mortal sin. Well, then go receive. 
Um, but then if you say, well, I don't know for a fact that I'm not in the state of mortal sin, then ask yourself a second question. Do I know for a fact that I am in the state of mortal sin? And the person might well say, well, actually, no, I don't know for a fact that I am in the state of mortal sin. Honestly and truly, I, I just don't know one way or the other. And you say, well, if you're, you know, if, if you're constantly in that state of perplexity, and you don't know that you, you know, routinely give in to these sins, you should go to receive our Lord and Holy Communion. Just the fact that you're scrupulous kind of tips the scales in your favor, especially if the only thing you have to say is, well, I do fear often giving in to these sins, but I don't know that I really have in the past, then go to receive. Um, you know, the fact is, as you tell me now, you would not receive Holy Communion if you knew for a fact you were in the state of mortal sin. And uh, so you have the will not to commit a sacrilege under any circumstances. And you can, you can go receive uh, with peace of conscience that you are, you are not committing a sacrilege by going even with that vague concern or scrupulous doubt in your mind. So that's one thing that uh, seems to be a, a sticking point for scrupulous people when it comes to communion. They're just wracked with <laughs> doubt about what they should do. Um, but I tell them this, and because they're still going to be afraid. They're still going to say, well, what if I'm just kidding myself? What if I'm just rationalizing this away? What if I find out at some point that all this time I've just been deceiving myself? Tell them, look, do you trust that God wants to save your soul? Well, yes, I do. Do you trust that our Lord will give you the information you need to save your soul? Yes, I do. So you have to trust that even if you are deceiving yourself, that you persevere, you beg God for mercy, that the moment will come when he will make it perfectly clear to you. And then then you will have the answer you need. But your doubts are not the answer. You can't, you can't lead your life on the basis of basically what you don't know and can't figure out. You have to m humbly wait for God to make it clear. And you have to proceed. You have to move forward. You have to practice the Catholic faith. And uh, as long as it's just a matter of vague anxieties and doubts, Yes, you should be going to receive our Lord. You need those graces. And you have to trust him that, yes, okay, maybe you are deceiving yourself, but the fact is you are deceived, even if it's only by yourself. And our Lord loves you enough that he will make it clear. And when he does make it clear, even if he makes it clear that you were deceiving yourself all the time, if he does, your reaction will be, oh, thank, thanks be to God. Thank, you'll feel such a tremendous relief because now you know and you know exactly what you have to do to make things right. And that's a great, great grace. That will be a great testimony in your own mind and heart of God's love for you. That finally it will be crystal clear and you will have entered a kind of like the spiritual promised land <laughs> at that point and be relieved of that anxiety. And uh, you will do, you will know exactly what is wrong. You will know exactly what you have to do to make it right. And God will deliver you from this, from this heavy cross. Many of the saints went through periods of scrupulosity. You know, and it was meant to purify as part of the dark night, the kind of a dark night of the senses, dark night of the soul, even in some advanced souls. So um, it could very well be that dealing with this effectively and humbly, trustingly, is a necessary part of one's advancement in the spiritual life. It's a cross. Carry it for our Lord. Okay. Father, anything else you would like to add to me? It's always dangerous to ask you that question. Well, I'll just uh, tell you, uh, you know, whether we have three days of uh, intense thick darkness besetting the world, we think of the time when the world was plunged into darkness. 
for three hours. We read that when our Lord was crucified, from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, the world was plunged into darkness when our Lord hung dying on the cross. Right? And so, you know, we, we are in a, a very dark spiritual uh, world right now. Spiritually very, very dark world right now. And yes, even the very air we breathe is toxic with all kinds of boundless temptation, errors, blasphemy, sacrilege, so on. Um, but through it all, uh, our Lord is with us every bit of the way, even as really as he was with us on the cross that day, as he really was hanging there in that darkness. And he, the light of the world, right, raised up. There were very few souls at that time who saw that light. On Calvary, they were, their attention was totally fixed on him. And so they saw that the light of God was there raised up for the whole world to see. And in the darkness, so many were blinded. But our Blessed Mother, right, and uh, those devoted to our Lord uh, kept their eyes focused on him. And that's exactly what you and I need to do today. We need to keep our eyes focused on our Lord. Even if the whole world, again, is plunged into darkness, and the whole world wants to, you know, crucify our Lord, and cry again, crucify him, crucify him, um, our eyes will be steadfastly fixed on him. The three hours is on the cross, the three days of darkness, if it comes, that's where our attention is going to be. And if we have our, our attention fixed on him, we will not walk in darkness. There is no darkness with him. The light shined in the, in the darkness, right? And the darkness grasped it not. So that's the key for all of us. That's our faith. Father, thanks for being here tonight. Appreciate your time. Certainly, Tom. Thank you. Yep. God bless you. Thanks to all, all of our viewers as well for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady of Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and to pray and do penance. Thank you and God bless you.